Hi. Low on cash, but want to live? You know, many people just like you have come to me and asked, Chris, how can I get money to cover rent and groceries? I ask them, do you have viable organs? When they say yes, that's when I suggest today's sponsor, Modest Proposal Organ Harvesting. If you're a victim of capitalism, consider opening an account with MPOH. They have many packages for the poor to choose from. They don't have to take all your organs at once. You'll have time to grow new ones. We can work out an extraction installment plan. Unless, of course, you sign up for our Express package, which takes several of your organs at once but leaves you just enough to make it home. Modest Proposal Organ Harvesting Because you're poor! This ad was inspired by Jonathan Swift. In 1729, he satirically proposed the Irish sell their babies to rich English people to eat, so they would have enough money. On the one hand, people were appalled at the idea, of course, but on the other, Swift was just suggesting the people continue to follow the law and respond to market forces. After all, what else could they do? Steal back everything the landlords had stolen from them? That would be illegal and violent. Two of the bad things. Swift was just making a suggestion for moderates who don't want to resort to extreme measures like liberation. In this series of videos, I've been talking about the ways the capitalist system we live under steals from us, and I've mostly been talking from a historical perspective, but this video will be more about the present, the market as most of us experience it. I've talked a lot about original expropriation, which through various processes separated people from commonly owned resources and began charging money for them, the result of which was to force the people who relied on those resources into the labor market, so they had to work all day and pay for everything they needed in money. The state was in effect criminalizing self-sufficiency, because how now we could only survive on money. So we had to get it from the rich people who had it all, and that's where we are today. Under such conditions, many people fall behind on the millions of things they need to pay for. Nowadays, it's not uncommon to hear people have to choose between buying food and buying their medication. This system is set up and maintained through violence, mostly the violence of the state, and being forced to choose between food and medicine when both are available is the result of violence. It's not a personal failing. It's because the market demands you make that choice. This is an example of what Marx called the silent compulsion of the market. As he said, hunger makes an almost perfect substitute for the whip. Everything has already been taken from us. So if we want to eat, we owe the owners of everything our time and bodies and energy. We have to find jobs and obey orders and schedules and work all day to make other people rich and never complain. Then we're allowed to have just enough of what was once just available to survive until tomorrow so we can come back to work. That's what the market is. To think of the market as some kind of incomprehensible force that magically benefits everyone is to ignore all that and believe in economists who say, when these lines behind me go up, everyone in the world benefits. The fact is, the market is the product of choices made by the richest people to expand their wealth by creating a situation that forces people to make it for them. Today, we need money for everything, not just enough to pay for food and rent, but an endless amount, because we could always benefit from more and the number of things we need to spend money on or save money for keeps rising. Meanwhile, the price of everything keeps going up too, but wages don't go anywhere. We're compelled to do more and more on the same amount of money until we lose our source of income, which makes it even harder. 
But just because you're poor, just because you need money and no one will give it to you, doesn't mean you're allowed to steal. People look down on illegal stealing, but are oblivious to centuries of stolen land, resources, and life. If you let rich people and their institutions make your mind up for you, you might think it's fine for a few people to just take everything by force, make everyone else work, and keep the benefit, while punishing anyone who dares take more than their allotted 15 crumbs an hour. But if you question this situation, you might have sympathy for criminals, and the ruling class doesn't want that. I never learned how the economy really works anywhere but from books I read long after finishing my degree. Apparently, none of my professors of politics, history, and economics thought it relevant to bring up the reality of the system, along with the beliefs and customs that resulted from this period. I don't remember anyone saying, like, uh, why do we assume the current distribution of wealth and property is legitimate? Why are the laws and other institutions that create this disparity legitimate? Who says liberal democracy and so-called free markets are the only system that isn't disastrous and freer, fairer systems just aren't possible? Who says? It's more convenient to make certain assumptions, regardless of whether there's evidence behind them, and proceed from there. We could always find reasons not to question the status quo, including all the latest neoliberal reforms and the adequacy of the nation-state to do something if necessary. We assumed the only two possible economic systems ever in the world anywhere are this and so-called communism, and obviously this one's better, and there's something magical about markets and property that just make you free, and markets are efficient. So if you're still making excuses for capitalism, possibly in the hope that it could be different because it works differently in theory, think about how things actually work outside the classroom, how they affect you and where your beliefs about them come from. Continue to use the euphemism of the free market to hide the violence that created and maintains it, if you like. But just remember, the market has never represented freedom. The market has never at any time in history been free from state intervention, i.e. force. Original expropriation was necessary for the ruling class to separate workers from their land and force them to work. Once the legal system was updated to consolidate these changes, the everyday violence of so-called market forces replaced the huge violence of original expropriation. The state was heavily involved at first, but soon just needed to change the laws and taxes and excuses as the capitalist class wanted. The state and the new capitalist class established the social structure. Now all they have to do is hold it in place. Now think about how many laws you would need to repeal to make any difference in this process. The system made it all permanent. There's no way to change it legally. The law exists to support the accumulation of wealth. You see, stealing is normal. It's the entire basis of the capitalist economy. We're so accustomed to thinking in terms of markets and the imperative to make money that we assume this is all human nature, that it's always been in one form or another, that our basic instinct is to work for someone else. I'm linking to books in the description for you to read that make it clear those beliefs are just a product of propaganda. When you don't know the history behind something, you're ripe for indoctrination. Back when I used to believe in the value and virtue of property, I used to think of taxation as illegitimate, but markets and wage labor legitimate. The difference to me at the time was taxation is the result of a system of force. No matter how much of what the state does you agree with, a system forces us under the threat of punishment to pay for everything the state does. The theft itself was the moral wrong. Markets are apparently voluntary, as is the means to buy things, wages, because in markets you have choices. 
but those choices are limited to what owners of capital allow you. You don't have the choice to live outside the market, don't have exactly the mix of qualities that we're looking for, then we won't hire you. Don't have quite enough money to pay for what you need, then you can't have it legally. The wage system, money, markets, and property are very much part of the same systems of force as taxation. They're just as much imposed on us as everything else. The threat of punishment is still there. Poverty is one of the worst punishments you can inflict on someone. So it's sad when people like old me try to argue in favor of these developments when it means they have to engage in a lifetime of meaningless labor. They'll say things like, capitalism lets you maximize your self-interest. I wonder where they got that phrase from. That's only true if you have money. How is it in your interest to give legal control of something you need to someone else? And we all have to work for them now. What they mean is capitalism lets a few people follow their economic interests at everyone else's expense, which could only look good to someone with a head full of economics classes. Most of us never have the financial freedom we're promised comes with money because we're spending all of it just trying to keep our heads above water. And if you look at how much debt people are in, you see many of us are drowning. Let's remember, we're in debt to people who have all the money already. It's not that they need more money. It's that if we're perpetually in debt, we have to work for them. You know, most revolts and rebellions throughout history have come at times and places of greatest inequality like now, and burning debt records is often first on the rebels' to-do list. That explains the end of Fight Club, too, by the way. Everything is owned by big corporations now, so they can raise their prices to whatever they want, and the most radical proposal most of us can think of is to ask the government to stop them. Most people work for these corporations, some as cashiers, where your job is to take money from people, some as security guards, whose job is to stop people from stealing, people who work in sales and marketing, which is telling people about the company, accounting, which is counting all the money, legal, because there are so many laws to follow, you need a team of lawyers, too. And the owner's big job is to own stuff. We call all those jobs contributing to society. At Costco, they even have people at the door to stop you coming in if you're not a member. All of this is more productive and efficient than just giving people food. The political economic system creates corporations, hierarchies designed to make people make wealth for their owners. The system requires hiring teams of managers, accountants, lawyers, advertisers, and others who are essentially unnecessary, but whose jobs are created by the requirements of the system. Since they have more specialized skills, skills that incidentally they had to have money or take on huge debts to acquire, they get paid more than people who just produce things. The people doing the most important jobs, making stuff, picking produce, cleaning, that kind of thing, get paid the least. So not only are we forced to participate in the workforce, there's a good chance you'll have to do the most boring work for just enough money to survive. It's wrong to say that we enter into contracts to work freely and voluntarily. We're forced to. How else are we supposed to survive? You didn't sign up to work because you like following orders. You signed under duress. We work to be allowed food and shelter. The contract is to cover the company's ass if you don't do everything expected of you. If it was to protect you, there wouldn't be so much wage theft, and you might be able to negotiate better conditions. But you can't negotiate better conditions because as members of the labor force, we are forced to compete against each other for labor. Hard work turns into a kind of arms race among workers as we're expected to be better than the next guy or we could get fired and replaced by the guy willing to work himself to death just to prove a point to his dad. 
your job never pays what you deserve because owners and executives get most of that. So you compete for promotions so that you can have more uninspiring responsibilities and miss more of your kids' football games. So you have to accept whatever conditions and orders you're given, you know, depending on the job, or you lose your livelihood. Under capitalism, your job, your life, your fate is work. What happens to you when you work all the time? I'm going to refer to Marx again, but I'm going to paraphrase heavily. I just don't want you to think I made this part up when I didn't. The less you do what you want, whether it's seeing friends and loved ones, meeting new people, reading, swimming, playing video games, going to the bar, or like me, all of the above and more, the less you are you. The you you want to be. And the more you become a tool rented out to the capitalist class. I mean, Marx left out the video games. So instead of living, we work. We don't have the time or money to do the things we want or the things that should be done and urgently, like reducing fossil fuel consumption, finding homes for people, freeing refugees, prisoners, and slaves. But you're totally free, trust me, bro. You're free to relax for a few hours before work starts all over again. I think it's pretty rich to praise capitalism as an efficient system. It's not efficient with anything. It's use of nature, consumption of energy, it's use of employees' time and output, making the best or cheapest products that last longer. You could probably think of all kinds of ways to make things more efficient. For example, production could be far more efficient if people shared information and technology across firms. But firms have to be in competition with each other to profit their specific owners. So they need to make indistinguishable products that break after three years. The alternative to me is these institutions would be owned by no one and work for everyone. So we could decide these questions together as people who are affected by them. It begs the question to say markets and competition is this e efficient system compared to the vast array of possibilities when we're free from compulsion. Because it's imperative for the corporation to always make money, in fact, to make more money than it did last year every year, they'll do anything to reach their goals. Slavery, for instance, has always coexisted with wage labor in the global economy. Child labor was the norm until only a couple of generations ago, and, well, they're bringing it back. It's not just the corporation that's geared toward generating a profit, though. It's everything. The state creates and enforces this legal framework, like forcing us to use money and forcing managers to work for shareholders. Police exist and have always existed to punish the poor for doing anything to make money other than work and preventing them from striking and unionizing. When people say police uphold the status quo, that's what they mean. The police maintain this system of theft and forced labor, and no amount of reform or training could ever change that. School is such a waste of time, it's only redeemed by claiming its purpose is to help you get a job. Employers uphold this claim by refusing to hire you if you don't have a degree, even when it's irrelevant to the work. Ideologies like racism, ableism, homophobia, and misogyny still exist, in part so some people make more money than others. If you're not a cishet, able-bodied white guy, you probably get lower wages, or for some other reason you've got to work harder, longer, and smarter than me to make the same money. Even your parents, who presumably want the best for you, will push you into studies and jobs that could mean 40 years of misery because the job pays well. Your whole life is designed so you work as much as possible. Health, solitude, fun, freedom, sleep, these are luxuries. They've been stolen from you and converted into wealth by a system that demands you give up everything worth living for in order to be allowed to keep living. What about time? That's the resource we seem to have the least. 
Under capitalism, everything is subordinated to time. You have to be on time for everything. You go late to school, you get punished. You hand in your assignment after the deadline, you get punished. You go late to work, you get punished, even if it doesn't matter. Even if you had a good reason, you should have left earlier. Since original expropriation, capitalists as a class own your time. So you've got to sleep the same time every day, or else you'll be too tired and feel like shit, and you still have to work the full day, however tired you are. Everything revolves around your job, so everything else is timed. All your activities, however fulfilling, have to end at a specific time so you can do the other carefully timed things on your list. Capitalism went from timing production to timing every aspect of life. Now we're at the mercy of the clock. The alternative to exclusive ownership of everything for profit is to practice managing the resource together. So that I don't have to talk about it here, I link to the book Governing the Commons by Eleanor Ostrom in the description so you can see how that works. And also to a video I made a couple of years ago about existing societies that practice self-management and independence from oppressive systems. Either way, it doesn't have to be like this. We can build a world based on freedom instead, but we need to end capitalism first.